I was in Chicago recently, and I finally managed to visit the Museum of Science and Industry, and hands down, the coolest thing in there was U-505, an actual U-boat captured during World War II that was open to tours. Yeah, that's, like, super cool. And kind of insane. So, let's chat about U-boats. And also Project Habakkuk, an insane Allied attempt to build an aircraft carrier out of ice to avoid attack by U-boats. Submarines played an essential role for the Allies in the Second World War. Not only did they attack enemy ships, but they also helped rescue downed pilots and protected merchant ships carrying goods, supplies, and even troops to countries in need. Throughout the war, American submarines destroyed about 55% of all Axis power warships and some 5.3 million tons of shipping. Of course, the Allies weren't the only ones with submarines. The German Navy also had submarines. Under Wasserboot were Unterseeboot in German, which gives us the English term U-boat. Similarly to its air force after the First World War, the Treaty of Versailles forced Germany to surrender its U-boats and barred the country from rebuilding its naval forces. But where Hitler found that rockets were a way of skirting the restrictions and rebuilding air power before the Second World War, there was no clever way around the naval limitations. So he straight up ignored it to build up Germany's U-boat arsenal starting in 1935. There were different types of U-boats, but they all share some basic similarities. They all had large hulls for increased battery storage, radar warning receivers, and powerful diesel engines. For defense, they had torpedoes and guns on the deck, and the ability to make chemical bubbles to throw off hunters. Some U-boats even pioneered having rubber skin made of anechoic tiles, codenamed Alberic during the war, that absorbed and dispersed sonar, helping them hide. It's something that's now quite common on submarines. U-505 was a Type 9C U-boat, a larger version of the Type 9, which was itself larger than the most common Type 7, sometimes called the Workhorse U-boat. But that doesn't mean it was luxurious by any interpretation of the word. It was just under 252 feet long, 22.2 feet across, and 31.6 feet high. But that's the entire shell, the outer hydrodynamic layer. The pressure hull, the inner volume kept under pressure to keep the crew alive, was even smaller. Power came from two saltwater-cooled diesel engines, each producing 2,170 horsepower to drive the two six-foot propellers, and steering came from a rudder. But it couldn't move too fast. On the surface, it could go about 21 miles per hour. Submerged, its top speed was closer to 8.5, which meant it was vulnerable to enemy ships. It was armed with six 21-inch torpedo tubes, four in the bow and two in the stern, and could carry 22 torpedoes on board. There was also a 4.1-inch deck gun and two anti-aircraft guns. Once it took on water to sink, it could safely operate at depths up to 750 feet. It had a range of almost 17,000 miles and could store enough supplies on board for patrol missions lasting up to 100 days. The crew was up to 60 men sharing 35 bunks, some of which were in the torpedo storage room and two bathrooms, one of which held food for the first couple of months of a voyage. Perishables like eggs and cheese and canned goods like meat and coffee eventually took on the taste of the diesel fuel that powered the engines. That scent permeated everything and was inevitably mixed with sweat and other body odors. There were no showers on board, and the crew could go for a very long time without being able to surface and open the hatch and let in some fresh air to clear out the scent. Life on board wasn't exactly pleasant, except that being in international waters, they did get away with playing some American jazz records that were banned in Germany. U-505 was completed in 1941, but didn't go out on its first mission until early 1942, when it circumnavigated the British Isles on its way to France. On February 11th of that year, it went out on its second mission towards West African waters to join the Battle of the Atlantic. By that time, the U-boat army was formidable. In 1942 alone, these German submarines took out more than 1,100 Allied ships. It was time for the Allies to start addressing the U-boat issue. The Allies were already moving their merchant ships in convoys, often with escorts, but in 1942 they came up with a new defensive mechanism, convoy support groups, also known as hunter-killer groups. These groups usually consisted of one escort carrier with several escort ships, including destroyer escorts. 
Planes launch from the ship's added air support, sighting and shooting U-boats to mark their location and force them to dive. Remember that they move really slowly underwater, so that increased the chance that the Allied ships could attack before the sub could escape. These ships used radar and sonar for tracking, but the most important Allied asset against U-boats was high-frequency direction finding, abbreviated HFDF and commonly known as HUFDA. This wasn't new technology in the war. Low-frequency direction finding was already in use, but the high-frequency version was a significant upgrade. Special arrays set up on either side of the Atlantic, as well as key midpoints like Bermuda, Greenland, and Iceland, listened for U-boats reporting home. It didn't matter what the message was, it could be something as simple as a weather update or a check-in, but it was helpful to give the Allies a ping of where the U-boat might be. Now, it was a pretty rough fix, but in 1942, Allied Navy started putting these antennae on ships, and the accuracy of pinpointing submarines' locations drastically improved. If two or more ships in one of these hunter-killer groups had the system, suddenly they could pretty accurately nail down a U-boat's location. The story of U-505's capture starts in March of 1944, when the U.S. Navy gets reports of what looks like two submarines around the Bay of Biscay near France. Analyzing the signals, Commander Knowles of the 10th Fleet determines it's actually only one ship, and he figures it's an older U-boat that can only patrol for about 90 days before having to head home. Given its position, he estimates it will start heading north sometime in May. Two months later, on May 15th, Task Group 22.3 leaves Norfolk for Cape Verde Islands on a routine patrol sweep. The central ship is the escort carrier USS Guadalcanal, commanded by Captain D.V. Gallery. Accompanying her are destroyer escorts Chatelaine, Flaherty, Jenks, Pillsbury, and Pope. Nine days later, on May 24th, that unknown submarine that the Navy first found back in March turns north, right on schedule. More Huff Duff fixes close in on the U-boat's location, and the messages pass to the Guadalcanal to start tracking it. They're only about 300 miles from the sub's last known location, so they're in a good position to reach it. By the end of the month, their paths look to be just days from intersecting. As May turns to June, the ships get closer and the hunt heats up. Guadalcanal is now getting radar contacts and hearing propeller noise on sonoboys, but they still can't see the U-boat. Planes are out patrolling the area all day, and they can't find it either. And a new issue pops up. Guadalcanal is starting to get low on fuel. They're running out of time. On the morning of June 4th, Guadalcanal finally has to throw in the towel. She turns north toward Casablanca to refuel. But at 10 past 11, Gallery gets a message from the Chatelaine. Frenchie to Blue Jay, I have a possible sound contact. The sub is right underneath them, between Guadalcanal and its starboard or right side escort ships. Guadalcanal moves west out of the way and launches two Avengers aircraft to help from the sky as Pillsbury and Jenks move in to help Chatelaine. The scene inside U-505, meanwhile, is fearful chaos. The crew, under command of Oberlieutenant Harold Lang, try to dive deeper to hide, and the crew frantically shuts down everything electric so they can't be heard. They even turn off the lights. The buzz from an electric light bulb is enough to give away their location. Sitting in silence in the dark, they hear a ping. It's the Allies. They can see the sub. Chatelaine fires 20 anti-submarine hedgehogs. No sound of explosion means they didn't hit their target. So Chatelaine circles around as Wildcat aircraft see the U-boat and start dive firing to mark the location with bullet splashes. Chatelaine fires 14 600-pound depth charges. The shockwaves shake the American boats, but it's nothing compared to the damage to U-505. One of the charges punctures a hole in the outer hull. The force of the blast sends the crew flying around inside the cramped ship. Warning lights flash and signals blare. It's just chaos. One of the charges also damages the rudder, jamming it to starboard. The now limping U-boat starts taking on water. Oberlieutenant Lang gives the order to surface, and U-505 breaks through the waves about 700 yards from Chatelaine. The Wildcats are still shooting, and almost as soon as Lang climbs out onto the deck, he's wounded. His second officer, who follows just behind him, is also hit and falls unconscious. Lang takes in all the ships surrounding him and realizes there's no chance. He gives the order to scuttle and abandon ship. The submariners start running up the tiny ladder to the hatch, well, one stops long enough to open a six-inch strainer in the control room. Water starts flooding in. 
Once it's clear that the Germans are abandoning ship, the Americans stop firing and Commander Hall of the Pillsbury gives the order, away boarding parties. At the museum, they made a huge deal about the fact that it had been over a hundred years since an American crew had heard such an order. The entire capture lasted for less than half an hour. By the time the boarding party lands, U-505 is sinking in earnest. But the Americans don't hesitate. They race down the hatch looking for code books or anything valuable for Allied intelligence. And that's when they see water rushing in through the strainer. Xenon Leucosis finds the cover, amazingly it's right next to the strainer, and puts it back in place, stemming the flow and helping keep the boat afloat. But U-505 is sitting really low by this point and waves crashing over her are spilling water down through the hatch. So the men close the hatch while they pillage. An insanely dangerous move, but it pays off. They're able to collect important documents and exit, leaving an empty U-505 floating awkwardly but with her motor still running. 59 of U-505's crewmen, only one man died in the capture, board Guadalcanal as prisoners of war as the ship begins the arduous task of towing the sub. The jammed rudder means it's constantly trying to turn, putting immense strain on the tow line. It's also waterlogged, so heavier than it ought to be. Progress is slow, and there is a pervasive fear that they'll be seen by other U-boats. They could be attacked, but worse, they'd lose the edge brought on by the material they pilfered from the sub. One night, the tow line breaks, and the group spend the night keeping track of the sub, which they're all amazed to see still floating in the morning. Knowing they have to do something to simplify the tow, they go into the submarine through the aft torpedo room, which thankfully, and incredibly, doesn't lead to more flooding, and gives Guadalcanal engineer Tresino a chance to straighten the rudder, charge the batteries, and use the ballast pump to re-establish trim. Once more buoyant and cooperative, U-505 is towed to Bermuda, where its existence is hidden. Except that a few hundred men saw the whole thing happen. They're all sworn to secrecy and forced to turn in any souvenirs they might have grabbed. The sub is renamed the USS Nemo and guarded for the rest of the war. Once the war ended, U-505's capture was made public and it was towed from port to port as a traveling act to help sell war bonds. It ended up in Chicago after a suggestion from Gallery's brother. It's their hometown, it ought to rest there since he led the team that captured it, and it should be turned into a memorial. The Museum of Science and Industry gained the title to U-505 in 1954 and arranged for it to be towed from Portsmouth, New Hampshire, through the Great Lakes, and placed out front on the lawn. In the early 2000s, after half a century of exposure to tourists and the elements, it was moved into its permanent home in a specially built gallery. The whole time I was touring the exhibit and thinking about the Allies defending against U-boats, I kept thinking about another, far less famous way that the Allies tried to deal with the German threat. This story also starts in 1942. The Allies are planning a reoccupation of Europe and are still suffering heavy losses to U-boats in the Mid-Atlantic, largely because aircraft have a limited range they can patrol before running out of fuel. They can fly from aircraft carriers, but these are the ships targeted by U-boats. There is what Churchill calls a Mid-Atlantic Gap. The Allies need more ships at a time when steel and aluminum are in short supply and needed more urgently elsewhere. Nevertheless, preparations for the reoccupation continue, most of it falling on Lord Louis Mountbatten, Chief of Combined Operations. One of his science advisors, Jeffrey Pike, comes to him with a novel idea. Build a sort of iceberg ship, a ship 4,000 feet long, 600 feet wide, and 130 feet deep that could survive in the colder northern Atlantic waters because it would be made of ice. Insulated and cooled, it would have natural protection from bombs and torpedoes and be a strong enough platform for airplanes. And, most appealing to Churchill, it could be a floating base from which to launch an invasion. The key to the design was the material, Pycrete, named in honor of Pike. It's a mixture of 14% sawdust and 86% water by mass. Mountbatten has a block of Pycrete made by a Canadian engineering company ahead of the Quebec conference in 1943 with the goal of getting the Americans to back the program. During the conference, he performs a dazzling demonstration. He shoots a block of ice with his pistol and it shatters. Then he shoots the block of Pycrete. Not only does it not break, it sends the bullet ricocheting around the room and, according to some accounts from attendees, it narrowly misses hitting Chief of Air Staff Sir Charles Portal. 
Nearly disastrous, yes, but the demonstration is hugely effective. The project is a go, at least in small scale for the time being. Engineers start building a model in Lake Patricia near Jasper, Alberta in the summer. They need to know how piecrete will stand up to warmer weather. The frame of the ship is wood, 3 inch by 6 inch studs with 3 inch by 8 inch floor joists, and filled with ice ultimately cut from the lake. It's insulated, and three Freon compressors start circulating cold air through 6 inch iron pipes. Construction is promising, and additional tests out front of Chateau Lake Louise in Banff, also in Alberta, add another key piece of data. The hull will have to be about 35 feet thick to contain damage from bombs and torpedoes. Unfortunately, it all comes together too late. By the time testing is done, the Battle of the Atlantic is nearly won, and new metal aircraft carriers are giving the Allies the additional naval force they need. The project is shelved, the test bed stripped of machinery, and abandoned. Over time, the remaining physical pieces of Project Habakkuk sunk to the bottom of Lake Patricia. Today, there's a plaque marking the place where this truly bizarre war program briefly lived and then died. That's going to do it for me today. I hope you guys enjoyed this weird little dive into history. Thanks for sticking around, and I'll see you in the next one.